All right, let's try this again. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan White. I'm Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium, and I want to welcome you to our Tour of the Universe live stream today. Um, I, uh, I just discovered that um, uh, our behind the scenes producer, Bing Kwok, can't unmute me when I mute myself. So apologies for that. Uh, today's presentation is a tour of the universe. Typically, uh, when we show this, it's uh, a streamed for live from Morrison Planetarium as sort of a simulcast so that you're seeing the same thing that audiences inside Morrison Planetarium are seeing uh, this week because of our holiday schedule and also because of the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope over this past weekend. Uh, we uh, decided to do something a little different. So I'll be presenting about 25 minutes or a half hour. A tour of the universe will take you from Earth out into uh, the farthest reaches of the universe. Uh, but I'll also be focusing quite a bit on the James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, uh, in order to talk a little bit about what it will potentially reveal about the universe around us and why astronomers are so excited about the mission and also so nervous about the next uh, 30 days or so as the instrument is deployed. Now, most of the time, instead of seeing me, you'll be seeing a digital model of the universe, uh, basically a three-dimensional virtual model of the universe that we can fly through and use to talk about some of the spacecraft that are out there. And of course, as I said, we're going to focus a lot on JWST today, uh, but also um, be able to look at some of the phenomena that these spacecraft are going to be observing. So we're starting here at JWST uh, in its, what it will be its final location at what we call the L2 Lagrange point two, about a million miles from Earth, uh, farther out from, uh, from Earth's orbit from the sun. Uh, but this is not what JWST looks like right now, because when it was launched uh, back on Saturday, it had to be folded up like some kind of crazy engineering origami in order to have it fit on the rocket and be launched uh, to uh, eventually reach this location out in space. So um, just to give you a sense of what that looks like, we're going to, because this is a virtual model of the spacecraft, we can just um, fold it back up. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was packed into the rocket. And what makes astronomers so nervous over the next month, not only have we now successfully made it uh, through the launch stage and the deployment of portions of the spacecraft, uh, but there's a lot more that's going to have to happen. What's happened already is the unfolding of this uh, shield the, that you'll you see now continuing its sort of unfolding process. Um, this is sped up dramatically. This whole series of steps will take place over, as I said, about 30 days, uh, whereas we kind of sped through it very rapidly. Uh, the sun shield that we uh, saw here um, is partly deployed, and just in the past day, um, this the telescope instrument has actually uh, the the mirror and, and instrument package has been separated from that um, uh, from that shield uh, by a, enough of a distance to allow the telescope to cool down. So actually, let's go ahead and, and replay that sequence again. Uh, again, when JWST was launched, uh, these gold hexagons here represent the individual segments of the mirror, uh, and then folded around it, you can see. Uh, the shield that will help protect uh, the mirror from solar radiation and prevent it from warming up because, as I'll talk about in a moment, it's very important for the JWST instruments to and mirror to stay very, very cold out in space. Um, and if we play our high-speed unfolding process again, you'll see that that shield deploys first, uh, and then you'll notice that the, uh, the separation uh, between the the, the mirror uh, and the and the shield before the shield uh, sun shield deploys completely uh, allows uh, the the telescope to be kind of thermally insulated from the uh, from uh, the incoming radiation from the sun and as most people's conversations may have played out over the course of the past weekend when I happen to be talking to my family about this exciting, uh, development in astronomy question came up of why we need to be so concerned about the temperature of the JWST telescope. After all, it's pretty it's pretty cold in space, right? Uh, that's true, um, but there is a source of 
heat in the sense that there's infrared radiation coming from the sun and, and, and light coming from the sun that heats up anything that's in space. Uh, and there's a great kind of description of this. If you look at, um, and we'll share the link in the chat as well, uh, but if you look at the Where is Web site, we can actually kind of preview that for you now. Um, this actually shows you kind of the current status of the telescope and uh, allows you to, um, uh, to see not only kind of where it is, although I will note that this, uh, this timeline that shows uh, Web over kind of right over the word sunshield, um, uh, kind of over on the left, is not a distance from Earth to the L2 point. Uh, even though it, we see Earth on the left and the L2 point over on the right, uh, it's actually more of a calendar. So this is the uh, these are the 30 days in between the launch of the web and its eventual arrival at L2 in its fully deployed state. And over time, you'll see the JWST unfurl uh, and be fully de uh, deployed. Uh, and You'll see updates if you can go back to this page uh, to see the current status of the telescope as all of these various stages in the mission uh, take place. Um, but you can see here, actually, they just added here at the very top uh, a temperature for both the hot side and the cold side of the telescope. So the hot side is that solar, uh, that shield that's protecting the cold uh, mirror and telescope instruments from the basically incoming heat from the sun. And cold side is the uh, is the instrument package in the mirror. So actually, if you click on this, um, just to showcase that you can see the hot side here uh, labeled A and B, cold side labeled C and D. Um, and when we switch back to our 3D model of the telescope, you can see very clearly um, that the, um, uh, the, the shield here, these kind of layers of material are um, providing kind of insulation from incoming solar radiation so that the telescope itself, this uh, segmented mirror, those hexagonal shapes, uh, and the instruments, and uh, then the, the secondary mirror here, which uh, reflects light back toward the instruments, all of that can remain very, very cold as the mission proceeds. And that's important because any telescope needs to be kind of in the, uh, the cooler ambient temperature of its environment, but Webb is an infrared telescope. So you can see as we kind of rotate around here, uh, the Milky Way kind of appearing behind uh, the, uh, the telescope. That's the, what our galaxy looks like from inside. I can switch to an infrared view. So in visible light, uh, the galaxies, uh, the plane of the galaxy, looks fairly diffuse with the light of billions of stars, but in infrared light, and in this case, it's a composite image from the WISE uh, telescope, uh, WISE observatory, uh, that shows sort of mid-infrared wavelengths. The sky looks very different. What we're seeing here are wavelengths of light that are slightly longer than the wavelengths of light that are visible to the human eye. So these infrared, longer than red wavelengths reveal not like the hot stars that dominate our perspective uh, in visible light, but rather the cool gas from which stars form. And very importantly, in the case of the mission that the Webb Space Telescope is, uh, is designed to implement, it allows us to see light that's been redshifted as the universe has expanded. So you can see kind of this, um, this sort of um, haziness in the, uh, in the background image. That infrared emission is coming from clouds of gas from which stars and planets are forming. Uh, you can see our neighboring galaxy, uh, the large and small Magellanic clouds, two small galaxies in orbit around our own Milky Way. These are all very prominent in infrared light. And because it's a, a wavelengths of light that are a little shorter than our eyes can see because we're looking at stuff that's cooler than say the sun or other stars, the telescope itself needs to be kept at a very low temperature. Essentially, the infrared light it's measuring is like looking for heat, but it's looking for heat from relatively cool objects in the universe. So uh, this shield that we're getting a close look at uh, from our current perspective protects the 
telescope mirror and other instruments uh, from the incoming radiation from the sun so that it can maintain a very cold temperature uh, and be able to observe these very cool objects in the, um, uh, in the, in the universe around us. So let me go ahead and switch back to our visible view of the sky. So our bright infrared view of the Milky Way shifts to uh, the more familiar Milky Way kind of starlight obscured by clouds of dust in the distance. And let me go ahead and leave our Webb Space Telescope behind as we kind of flip our perspective for it to appear kind of upside down uh, to our um, from our from our usual view of the uh, of the observatory, and uh, and kind of look at this in the context of our solar system, and then talk a little bit about some of the things that the Webb Space Telescope will be telling us, uh, some of the things that we hope to learn, and put that in the context of this three dimensional model of the universe that I described a moment ago. So if you know your constellations, you'll see Orion drifting by there in the background. What I'd like to do is, um, I apologize, I seem to have a little misinterpretation between my keyboard and the um, uh, and my interface. So I keep getting a nice Windows blue screen popping up. Uh, but let me go ahead and bring up the um, orbits of the planets and talk a little bit about where the JWST is in our solar system. So I apologize with them, with uh, our little glitch there in the computer. I need to um, kind of put the pedal to the metal and pull away from our James Webb Space Telescope model. And we should see the orbits of planets appearing soon to give a little sense of where we are in our solar system. Um, here we go. My apologies. I um I don't know why the uh, Windows operating system wants feedback from me, but it's a little unfortunate that it keeps asking for it in the middle of our presentation here. Well, the orbits that you can see in the um, uh, in our model here are uh, the orbits of the planets around the sun. Um, I am going to uh, just try to reset my software here enough to be able to um, get this to behave a little better. Um, but um, what I'm hoping you'll be able to see here in a moment is our um, Uh, I apologize for this. We're, um, my software is not behaving at all the way I had hoped uh, or the way it was behaving even um, a few minutes ago when we were testing everything. So I do apologize for this. Um, let me go ahead and actually just quickly start try restarting here. So um, let's go back to our view of the JWST um, diagram here. And as I restart some of the software in the background, uh, maybe we can just um, sort of showcase how the um, um, how how Web is going to be uh, deployed over the next thirty days here. Um, one other great resource on the Web is actually the. Um, uh, um, a blog that uh, scientists who are working on the space telescope uh, are adding to. And um, I think we can share that in our, uh, in our, in the chat as well. And my apologies as I sort of stammer through this, as I try to restart our software. Um, but um,
one of the great things that NASA is really focused on is communicating very clearly all the various stages of this remarkably complex engineering feat uh, as the uh, as the Webb telescope continues its um, transition from Earth uh, to the Lagrange point about a million miles from from here. Um, one of the things that uh, you can expect is that after um, about a month when it arrives in its location in the, at the this sort of gravitationally stable point um, the um, um, uh, there's going to be another period of, of several months as more engineering tests uh, are take place um, and in the process, uh, you can you can expect that it's going to be um, several um, several months before any results uh, come out from uh, from like visible pictures or whatever uh, that would be released to the press. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a wait as the uh, as the engineering part of the process uh, takes place uh, over the course of the next several months. So uh, we're back up with our software here again. I apologize. Um, we have. A little bit of um, uh, glitchy performance here. Um, again, not what I was seeing just a few minutes ago when we were testing everything. But we're kind of leaving Earth behind. And you can see the orbits of other planets in that, that little circle that's sort of disappearing around Earth. That's actually the orbit of Earth's moon around our planet. Um, and as an aside, that's as far as humans have ever traveled out into space. Uh, so the um, uh, that distance from Earth to the moon uh, is only about uh, a second and a half in terms of light travel time. And that's a measuring rod that humans like to, or at least astronomers like to use uh, because light travels at a finite speed, but at a consistent speed in the vacuum of space. So in uh, traveling at 186,000 miles per second, uh, it traverses the distance between Earth and the moon in about a second and a half. And even though it's a uh, 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second, that distance from the sun to Earth takes more like eight minutes uh, or eight and a half minutes. Uh, so when you actually look not directly at the sun, but when you see light from the sun, it's eight and a half minutes old. It's taken eight and a half minutes to travel from the sun to Earth. As we pull back from our view of the solar system here, and you see the orbits of the, uh, the four inner planets and now uh, the, um, uh, the four outer planets, uh, what I should have mentioned, actually, apologize. Let's go back in close enough to see our orbit of if Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are four inner planets. Um, as I mentioned, uh, JWST is about a million miles from uh, Earth away from the Sun. Uh, so that distance um, from the Sun to Earth is around 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. And so uh, JWST is just, you know, not even a, a, a percentage. Uh, farther away from Earth than uh, uh, farther away from the Sun than Earth is, uh, but it's far enough to to get it out into the cold vacuum of space uh, and to be able to make the observations that it needs to. So now leaving our solar system behind again, we have inner planets: Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the four outer planets. Often in our tour of the universe, we talk a little bit about our solar system, but in today's case, we're going to uh, what was software problems and our focus on JWST, we're going to pull away from our solar system and actually focus a little bit more on things that are a bit farther away. We've actually been kind of cheating the brightness of the sun here. So we're going to brighten the sun so it's consistent with the brightness of other stars uh, in our depiction of the universe around us. And you can see here that uh, now we're traveling far enough away uh, from our solar system that the stars are kind of pulling away from the familiar constellations and we're seeing the thousands of stars that are relatively close to home uh, as they um, uh, as we kind of orbit and again in our virtual model of the universe we're not constrained by uh, the speed of light so uh, we've traveled many times many many times the speed of light uh, to get out to this distance so we're actually uh, tens of light years from home uh, and actually, what I'd like to just showcase briefly here is a quick look at the um, at the extrasolar planets, the planets that we've spotted in orbit around stars other than our sun. 
So uh, we can circle the stars that have uh, planets in orbit around them. These circles don't rep represent the orbits of the planets themselves. Instead, uh, these are just markers that show where planets exist in orbit around other stars or where stars exist that have planets in orbit around them more precisely. And we now know of thousands of these planets in orbit around other stars, but we're very curious to learn where these planets come from, how the planets form, uh, and to learn more about the planets themselves. And JWST is well equipped to answer questions on uh, many such questions. Uh, because it's looking at infrared light, it's looking at uh, sort of the birthplaces of these uh, of these planets and stars. Um, and because the planets are warmed by the light of their star, but they're not as hot as the stars that they orbit, we can use JWC's infrared uh, powers to observe the light from these, uh, these planets in orbit around their parent stars. So all of these planets reside fairly close to uh, uh, the sun and our solar system in the scheme of things. They are all inside our Milky Way galaxy where we've only had kind of the sort of faintest glimmer of evidence of planets outside, uh, orbiting stars outside our own galaxy very recently. Um, but all of those thousands of planets are orbiting some of the hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Now we know we're not seeing all of the planets. In fact, we suspect that virtually every star in our galaxy is host to planets in orbit around it. So we expect that there are hundreds of billions, if not perhaps a trillion planets in our galaxy. And that means that there's a lot to explore and a lot more to understand when it comes to understanding planets around other stars and the story of how planets form. Again, both of those questions are questions that the JWST is well positioned uh, to, to answer. Um, I mentioned the large and small Magellanic clouds. Those are these two objects that were very bright when we looked at the sky at infrared light. Uh, those are two satellite galaxies of our own home galaxy. So this is a close-up view of our Milky Way. We have never exited the Milky Way to see what it looks like, but this is a model based on what we observe in other galaxies uh, and based on our understanding of uh, basically a computational model, uh, our understanding of the dynamics of stars in our own galaxy. Now, the faint kind of dots that you see in the background, those are not stars. Those are actually the locations of individual galaxies. Rather than showing them what as they would uh, appear to the naked eye, which would be extremely faint, we're illustrating them as dots markers that show you the locations of these distant planets, distant galaxies, sorry. And notice that they're kind of clumped and clustered together. So as we pull away from our Milky Way galaxy even farther, uh, we can see that um, we're now pulling far enough away that uh, some of the points are kind of changing their locations. Uh, so that we're seeing this three-dimensional structure of where galaxies reside in the universe around us. Um, over here on the left, we have the Virgo cluster of galaxies, uh, a collection of about a thousand galaxies with a very massive um, elliptical galaxy at its center. And I'm not showing you any up close images of galaxies, but some of them look a lot like our own Milky Way. Some of them look like more kind of diffuse collections of stars. Um, but um, uh, and here we're fading up some more of the locations of these galaxies as revealed by surveys. But within this um, kind of data set that I'm showing you, we're looking at the locations of literally hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Now, you'll also notice that there's kind of a gap here at the top and the bottom. Uh, and in fact, the universe is not bow tie shaped. It's just that these are surveys. These are actual surveys of galaxies, actual data that reflect the observations that we've made of the universe around us. We haven't completely surveyed the universe around us. So there are regions that are missing uh, data. Uh, and some regions that, uh, as you can see here on the left, where you see these kind of stripes extending off to the left, uh, those are regions that have been maybe a little bit more thoroughly explored than others. But you can see that there's kind of this clustering of galaxies and kind of a um, what we 
often referred to as the large scale structure of the universe. There is there are regions where there are lots of galaxies, regions where there are relatively few. And what's fascinating from an astronomical perspective is that this dates back to a very early stage in the history of the universe. So the distribution of galaxies, the clumping and clustering of galaxies, the large scale structure of the universe, these are things that seem to have been kind of baked into uh, our universe from a very early stage. Um, but we're still needing to connect the dots. So I'm going to pull away through our various, um, uh, all of these circles and points actually represent uh, individual, in this case, quasars, which are, are the bright cores of young galaxies, uh, visible at even greater distances uh, than galaxies. These collections of hundreds of billions of stars are visible. Uh, so the points here and the kind of the toward the center, which are all kind of blurred together in our view here, those are individual galaxies. And then the more distant points are the bright cores of young galaxies. The background that you're seeing here, the sort of modeled red and black appearance uh, that's, uh, that's kind of like this very distant wallpaper <laughs> uh, behind uh, these individual points, is what we call the cosmic microwave background. The microwave background is a remnant of very early stage in the history of our solar of our universe. So as the universe cooled down and light could travel significant distances, we see that primordial light in the form of what we call the cosmic microwave background. This light is only dates back to an, an era when the universe was only maybe a few hundred thousand years old. The universe is now, we now know to be about 13.7 uh, billion years old. So this is very young light uh, in the history of the universe. And you'll notice that it's kind of clumpy, kind of like the clustering of galaxies uh, that we see close to home. Uh, and in fact, the dark regions here correspond to kind of cooler parts of the cosmic microwave background. The brighter portions of the image correspond to hotter parts. The cooler parts are a little bit denser. The hotter parts are a little less dense. And we understand that this sort of clumpiness of the distribution of matter in the early history of the universe as recorded in this image, the cosmic microwave background, evolved into the clusters of galaxies and the galaxies and the stars and planets that we see today. But that process is still being revealed by our observations of the universe around us. Now, I mentioned early on that one of the benefits of having JWST as a telescope that's observing in infrared light is that it can observe light that has been redshifted uh, from visible light into uh, infrared light. And in fact, the cosmic microwave background is a perfect example of that. When that light was emitted, it was emitted, give or take, in a visible part of the spectrum. We would have been able to see that with our unaided eyes. But over time, because the universe expands, that light was redshifted or stretched to longer wavelengths. And we now see it in the microwave part of the, rest of the, of the spectrum which is an even longer wavelength of light than infrared. So because JWST can observe at infrared wavelengths with great sensitivity, it can potentially observe starlight, the light of galaxies that date back to an era that has been so far inaccessible, so far unobservable to us uh, because we didn't have instruments with sufficient sensitivity working at the right wavelengths. So. JWST is going to help us fill in this picture and help us understand how we go from the clumpiness of the cosmic microwave background to the structure of galaxies that we see close to home. So with that thought, uh, uh, we've kind of talked about some of, the, some of the big ideas that JWST will hopefully illuminate in its, um, with any luck, decades of, observa uh, of observations. We learned this week that um, shortly after launch that uh, it used its fuel so efficiently in its launch and uh, process and, um, and its trip so far 
uh, that it has plenty of fuel reserves for a very extended mission. So with any luck, JWS, JWST, uh, after its month of um, deployment, will have decades of functionality in its future. And it will be able to help fill in this image of uh, the cosmos that we're seeing in our virtual representation um, here. I'll, I'll just mention one last thing before we head home. It's a little deceptive because it kind of, the way we're looking at this, it kind of looks like we are at the center of the universe because we came from down here. Uh, and of course, all of these observation lines, uh, lines of sight reaching out into the universe around us kind of point back to home. And that's just because we're the ones making the observation. We're at the middle of this image of this three-dimensional representation of the universe because we're the ones drawing the map. We're the ones drawing the three-dimensional map. So we end up at the center because we're illustrating the distances to these objects relative to our own perspective. So with that thought, let me go ahead and steer us back home. I apologize. We've uh, had some, I've had, because I've had some software issues, this is not quite the, um, quite the dramatic flight I usually try to execute. Uh, but we'll kind of move through, we faded down our cosmic microwave background. We'll move through these individual points representing the locations of hundreds of thousands of stars, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of galaxies um, in the observable universe around us. Back toward our own home galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And eventually back to our solar system and home. So I should note that this software that I'm using is called Open Space. It normally behaves much better than my demonstration would suggest that it has today. Uh, so uh, I would highly recommend if you have a computer at home that can handle a bit of um, a bit of high intensity graphics. Um, open Space is an open source software sponsored by NASA. Um, you can go to openspaceproject.com and we'll put the link in the chat uh, to be able to download the software and play with it yourself. But uh, it is a powerful tool, again, much more powerful than uh, my uh, presentation today might suggest, given uh, the problems I had with it. Uh, we're going to, we're moving past our extra, extrasolar planets now, but we'll go ahead and fade those down. We're moving close to the thousands of stars that are relatively close to our own home star, the sun. And we'll finally uh, approach our solar system get a look at the orbits of the planets around the sun as we fade the sun down to a brightness that makes that more easy to see. So past the outer planets in toward our inner solar system to the third rock from the sun, our own home planet Earth. Um, I really want to thank you all for joining me today. I apologize for the technical challenges ranging from audio at the beginning of the presentation uh, to, um, to some uh, unfortunate Windows pop-ups uh, during uh, the middle of the presentation, uh, but really appreciate your taking the time to learn about the JWSD project um, and hope you'll join us for some of our future broadcasts every 4.30 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. You can watch on the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page uh, and the California Academy of Sciences YouTube page as well as the Open Space YouTube page. You can catch our live simulcast of a similar program, Tour of the Universe. Um, and, uh, and if you have any questions, please put them in chat. We'll keep an eye on that uh, and answer them um, as we can. Again, thank you very much for joining us and hope you have a great Wednesday evening.